from wherever you are around the world. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be exploring the psychology of vision. Do you really see what you think you're seeing? We're going to find out with Dr. Dale Purvis. He is professor of neurobiology at Duke University and he wrote a fabulous book right here, Why We See What We Do Redux. I highly recommend it if you want to know what you're looking at. So let's welcome to the circle, Dr. Purvis. Welcome to the circle, sir. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. This is a fascinating book. Uh, now I'm starting to have doubts of anything I look at. But before we get to that, what is the neurobiology of vision? How does it all work? If I'm looking at a person across the way, can you give us a, a brief process of how that works? Well, the short answer is nobody's really quite sure, but I can tell you uh, <laughs> roughly what people have figured out over the last 50 years or so. So or much longer. I mean, vision has been a highly interesting subject to neuroscientists, philosophers, and just about everybody else for a long time. <clears throat> so basically, of course, the way it works is that an image falls on your retina that excites photoreceptor cells. That information is turned into the coin of the realm for the nervous system, which is action potentials and synaptic potentials. Most of your audience probably know what I mean by that. Those signals are transferred to several stations in what's called the primary visual pathway through the thalamus to the primary visual cortex in the back of the brain and then on to higher regions of the brain where it's kind of broadly and generally imagined that perception takes place but that's covering a lot of territory and nobody really understands how you get from an image on the retina to a percept and as you suggested uh, in your intro the problem is that perceptions are very different from the world that we measure with physical instruments. That's a great point too. I know when I, I have a, in my head I have an algorithm of, of how we create attitudes or beliefs of something, but even when you're looking at something, like you said, it goes through the retina, eventually the thalamus, the visual cortex, when it gets to those higher processing areas, that's where the interpreting process begins and it looks like something goes funky there. Yeah, so the basic question that, you know, vision has somehow evolved to solve, but it's not quite clear how, is that we don't really have access to the physical world. That sounds strange because you look out there in the world, everything <laughs> looks the way it does, and you think, gee, uh, I'm looking at the real world. But of course, when you really think about that and apply measurement to it, what happens is that the measurements that you make with rulers, protractors, photometers, like the photometers that exist in all of our cell phones, any other physical instrument, don't correspond with the ways in which we see lightness, brightness, color, form, depth, motion. There's a disconnect between what we see in our subjective sense of the world and what's actually out there. And of course the question this raises is, well how can that be? I mean we survive in the world, but we somehow survive through vision and other sensory modalities without actually measuring that world. So when we catch a ball or do anything in the world, we're doing that without the benefit of actual measurement of the physics that uh, is, is involved. And that's really deeply puzzling. Not everybody, of course, wants to think about that or does think about it, even in vision science. But that's the fundamental problem. How do we succeed when we don't have access to the measurements that we make with rulers and other simple or not so simple instruments of physics? I remember um, there's another little pitfall I think we fall into when it comes to vision. You can kind of elaborate a little bit on this if you don't mind. I know I was listening to a professor giving a lecture a couple weeks ago. And they were talking about the saccades in your eyes and it's every four seconds we actually don't see anything is that true yeah so saccades we're doing those all the time saccades refers to kind of a ballistic movement that we make to focus on one thing or another in the visual environment those saccades happen three or four times a second <laughs> they for a reasonably large saccade it takes about 50 milliseconds to move the eye to a new place as we inspect somebody's face like I'm looking at yours or anything else and during that 50 milliseconds or whatever the time is that it takes to make the saccade we are not uh, 
seeing anything. We don't get any information, even though the information is falling on the retina. But the information that's falling on the retina is rapidly moving on the retina, and we somehow, our visual systems suppress that so that we just are unaware of that, uh, that movement on the retina. That's another example of the disconnect. We don't see subjectively what we don't need to see. I mean, another very good example <coughs> excuse me, is the blind spot. So there's a big area, uh, and anybody can demonstrate for themselves very easily that, that, that this is the case. There's a big area that doesn't get any visual information because the retina has a hole in it where the nerve, the optic nerve, comes out and feeds uh, information to the rest of the brain. That is um, an area that's um, eight or nine uh, degrees in, in size. A degree, if you put your thumb out in front of you and look at it, that's about one degree. So if you imagine eight or nine of those degrees up and down, that's the size of the hole in your visual field. You don't see that. I mean, there's no hole in your visual field, but you can demonstrate it if you put a penny <coughs> or even a quarter, even a half dollar. Uh, if you put it on a piece of paper and close one eye and look uh, at, a, at an X you make on the piece of paper, you can move the quarter around to the point where it simply disappears. So you, ha you can demonstrate that hole very easily. Huh. But uh, we're not aware of it. We don't see what we don't need to see. And that's, you know, what's going on in saccades. When you make those movements, yeah, there's just a fundamental disconnect between the physics of images on your retina or the physics in the world and what you actually end up seeing. Deep mystery. Now, do you think, in your opinion, do you, that's going to alter a little bit our perception, our ability to interpret the information we receive? Or is it too, too minimal to do anything? No, I mean, I think the, in, in, in the book you mentioned, there, there are a whole bunch of examples that show that this kind of disconnect is anything but trivial. I mean, the fact that um, we don't see things the way they are physically, you could say, well, that just biology is not perfect. That's kind of a side effect of the imperfections of biological vision. But you can show that that disconnect can be radical. So you can take a piece of paper, for example, and make it look either gray or black or white, the same piece of paper with the same light coming from it. You could make it look any different shade of gray depending on how you present the shades of gray, the illumination of the other uh, objects in, in, in the environment or in the circumstances of the presentation of that sheet of paper. This is not trivial. I mean, this is really basic. How can you imagine understanding what's going on if that piece of paper can look gray, black, or white, same piece of paper, same light coming from it. Not, not trivial at all. It's not something you can dismiss as, oh, well, biological vision is just a little bit imperfect. Let's move on. No. It's really radically disconnected from the reality that physics shows us exists in the world. That kind of reminds me of, a, of another study. I just forgot the name of the character. I know you, I'm mean, sure you've heard of it a million times. The Mueller Liars, I think, illusion? Yeah, the Mueller Liar illusion. Here it is sorry, here. Have, uh, these two lines, the shaft of the arrows, are exactly the same length, but they look different lengths when one end of the arrows, or both ends of the arrows, are decorated with arrow heads, the other decorated with arrow tails. So, of course, people have made all kinds of intuitive suppositions about what that is due to. Uh, but the reality is that today there's no generally accepted explanation for that effect. Another example of, you know, we see things that are different than they really are. The lines measure with a ruler. Hey, they're the same, but we don't see them the same. What's going on? How can we behave in the world when we're seeing things in this odd way? And in interestingly, I mean, you can make a Mueller liar object with pieces of wood or pieces of metal, anything you like, and show that this, this is not something on a computer screen or on the printed page. This is the way we see objects that are in that confirmation. Why? Nobody really agrees as to the answer of that. Wow, really? So there's still a lot of debate on this. For sure. Let me, um, there's a couple of things I think I'm, uh, in your book, I think. Visual, visual perceptions, I think people don't realize this, are really in the past 
right? Because we saw something and it's in the past, kind of like when we look at the sun, we're eight minutes behind the behind already. Well, that, that, that's a that's a tricky question. So, uh, and I think one has to sort of define carefully what one means. I mean. There is, of course, a lag between an image that falls on your retina and the time it takes that image to reach your brain. That's on the order of 100 milliseconds or so, a tenth of a second. So, but that's not what we're, we're, we're talking about here. When I'm referring to the past as influencing what we see, I'm referring to past experience that we see. Uh -huh. And a lot of people have had this idea and expressed it in different ways that what we see is very strongly influenced by what we've seen in the past. So that was the idea that was held by Helmholtz in the 19th century, if people know who uh, Hermann von Helmholtz was, by the Gestalt psychologists in the beginning of the 20th century to up to mid-century, and by a, a bunch of um, you know sophisticated thinkers since that clearly vision is influenced by what we've seen in the past. I think the way we're looking at it is a little more radical than just, okay, I recognize something because I've seen it in the past and therefore when I see a partial representation, let's say, of a cat, I'm going to recognize it in a cat because I've seen a lot of cats in the past. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about using past information in a much more radical way that evolution has employed to get around this fundamental problem that a lot of people, including us, have sometimes referred to as the inverse problem. You got an image on the retina. That image doesn't tell you what physically is out there in the world. How do you deal with that? How does the evolution of vision solve that? And the argument we've made is that it solves it by using past information to empirically, that is by trial and error, figure out what's going to work in the world without really knowing what's out there. And that's philosophically a, a difficult point for a lot of people to grasp. I mean, you look out in the world, everything looks, hey, like we've seen it since day one in our lives. What's peculiar about that? Well, what's peculiar is that when you think about it, uh, this disconnect is a philosophically profound problem that's telling us not as simple as we think. We have to understand how it is that the evolution of vision solved this inverse problem, getting back to the world from not incomplete information on the retina, but from no information about physical reality at all. That's mind-boggling for a lot of people. For me, I mean, yeah. it's mind-boggling. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to continue expanding on this, but I think I'm going to stop and get a Tylenol for a minute. Hello, my name's Matt, and I'm an addict. My mom was addicted to prescription pills when I was very young, before I even turned one. Are you or someone you know struggling with alcohol or drug addiction? Has everyone given up on you or your loved one? The caring staff at Elite Care understands and treats you as a whole person. We offer individual and group therapy, holistic healing such as yoga, nutrition and spirituality, medication management and PTSD treatment. By building upon your strengths and rebuilding broken bonds, we help you begin a successful life. With our staff of licensed psychotherapists and doctors, you can be assured of the highest level of care. Elite Care is the best option for long-term rehabilitation from drugs and alcohol. Contact 888-511-0607 for more information. How does the process work when you, when some, staying along the same theme of evolution, I see a stick. And for whatever reason, it moves. I don't know, maybe it was a worm or something that kind of moved it out of the way. But I think I see a snake first, but it really is a, sn a stick. So I can't imagine it's the retina issue. It must be some kind of interpretive process issue. Is that where the, oh. kind of what you're talking about? Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, you're raising a very good question. So we have to distinguish in this the information that we've gotten through the aegis of evolution from the information we've gotten through the aegis of experience in our lifetimes. So we didn't get born knowing that a stick was kind of looking like a snake in some conditions or some situations. We learned all that stuff. You know, I'll recognize your face tomorrow, and I learned that today. So there's an enormous amount of information we learn in, in life that is obviously 
experientially based. I mean, I know your face unless I've seen it before. But the beauty of evolution is that it incorporates the information, the basic information about uh, the world that we get not through individual experience but through the species experience that the whole uh, population of human beings and their ancestors have had uh, forever. So this is a very different way of uh, understanding vision and I should emphasize that it's not about recognizing your face or recognizing that a stick might look like a snake or might be mistaken for a snake because of the similarity of those objects. It's about taking human information from day one over the course of evolutionary history and creating the basic properties that we use to describe vision. Lightness, darkness, color, length, motion, depth. Uh, all of these things are fundamental qualities that are not about your particular face or that particular stick looking like a snake. It's the basic stuff, the basic perceptual information that we use to describe any visual uh, uh, image. And there's a big difference there and I think it's important to make that distinction. You're absolutely right. We have about five minutes and I have about Three more questions. Um, <laughs> well, we could talk we can about do. this forever, Carlos. I know. It seems like it. It's a really fascinating topic. Um, I'm trying to think which one I'm going to go first here. I'll tackle these two first because they're kind of related. They're, they're what they call blindness. Uh, they're cinema. Uh, so they have inattentional blindness. We've seen the invisible gorilla. Or at least yes, most yes, of us yes. on this field, I think, have. <laughs> and um, what's going on there? Well, uh, I think that's another domain. I mean, that, that demonstration of the gorilla is really a wonderful one. I've seen it umpty um times and never fail to be impressed by how inattentive we are <laughs> to things that we are not focused on. But again, I would take that as being in, in, in a different domain. I mean, attention obviously is something very important. We get an enormous amount of information through any sensory modality and, of course, in visual images, a huge amount. We have visual systems that tend to focus on particular parts of any scene or any sequence of scenes as in that gorilla demonstration. So what's going on is simply that if you don't attend to some part of the scene, you don't see it. And there are simpler examples than the gorilla of what's called change, change blindness where you take a scene, uh, the one I'm thinking of is an airplane, and in, it's the same image, but, you know, in one presentation, the complete airplane is there. In the next presentation, one of the jet engines is missing, but you don't notice that. I mean, people say, well, what's the difference between this picture and this picture? And the majority of people in the audience can't tell the difference. Why? Well, it's not that they don't see it, but if you're, unless you're focused on the engine, if you're looking at the cockpit or whatever, you don't see that. I mean, you only see what you attend to for really pretty obvious biological reasons. It's advantageous to see what we, you know, want to see at any moment given the context and whatever is going on and we don't attend to the rest of it and that's the gorilla, the missing jet engine. It's, <laughs> not, it's not, I mean, it's nothing terribly complicated in that sense. It's just a demonstration that we are kind of have a one-track mind with respect to what we attend to. We can attend to many things at one time. We tend to sequentially in consciousness focus on one thing at a time. Um, last question, I guess, for the day. Um, unfortunately, we're really limited here, but the gestalt patterns, you mentioned them earlier. Um, if I remember correctly, there are little, there's pictures of them online. You can get them in the books with the gestalt. They're incomplete. I, I can see one right now on the top of my head with a triangle and we yeah. tend to fill that in. What is going on there? Well, again, nobody's quite sure. If you ask 10 different vision scientists, they'll probably give you 10 different uh, answers, and I don't have <laughs> one that's any better than anybody else's. But again, we're using past experience. In this case, our experience with uh, frequently seeing triangular shapes in uh, what we've learn just by living or what we've been taught in school about triangles and so on and you tend to fill in. It's go, let's go back to the blind spot that I told you about before. So you don't notice that because you filled in 
the area that's actually a demonstrable hole in your in, in, in the visual scene. So, I mean, again, I don't think there's anything terribly mysterious going on there. It's that your visual system, your visual brain, will tend to fill in things that you're familiar with, but that are missing pieces. Again, we go back to the partial representation of the cat. You identify the cat when it's only, you know, uh, an ear and a whisker and a tail. Um, just because you've had a lot of experience with cats and you know that thing is a cat. You've had a lot of experience with triangles, you know it's a triangle. The mechanism, uh, nobody really knows. The purpose, straightforward. I mean, you don't want to um, make false judgments, but you want to make judgments based on your experience that are going to be helpful. If it's a triangle, it looks, you know, the, the Pac-Man pieces uh, are, are there in the corners of the triangle, you make the assumption that it's a triangle. Or I should say, this is not a cognitive process, but you, your visual brain makes the assumption that it's a triangle and you fill in the missing parts. That's a simplistic explanation, but I think something like that is going on. And again, to emphasize how stupid we are in uh, vision <laughs> science, nobody really, no, nobody has uh, a very good answer to that phenomenon, and the one I'm giving you is uh, is simplistic in the extreme. Oh, I, I know. I, I see the Gestalt patterns every time I look at my uh, check account balance. There's always a zero missing for some reason. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Purvis, again, for being on the show. Here's the book, Why We See What We Do, Redux. We appreciate it very much for you coming on. We thank you again. We thank you, everyone. Remember, our motto is simple. Wherever there's psychology involved, whether you're seeing me clearly or not right now, we are there. We'll see you next time, everyone.